This is Point Nemo. It's bang in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and is the one point on Earth that's farthest from land. The nearest shore is some 2,600 kilometers away. It's quite literally the middle of nowhere. Parts of the ocean like these are called the high seas. They cover half of the planet's surface and technically don't belong to anyone. Well, maybe except... And there's good reason for their fascination with the high seas. They are one of the last remaining wilderness on Earth, and scientists believe that they're a treasure trove of undiscovered secrets. One that's been threatened by illegal, unregulated fishing, pollutants, shipping, unusually high water temperatures, acidification. So how do we go about protecting this pristine, precious part of the ocean? Let's take a look. So first up, what are the high seas? They are part of the ocean that's outside the jurisdiction of any one country. They cover two thirds of the entire ocean. And yet, only 1% of the high seas are legally protected. The remaining is a free-for-all kind of situation with patchy regulations and uncoordinated management. But this wilderness is home to a lot of marine life, many of which we might not even have discovered yet. For many animals, the high seas is also an important route for migration. Take the humpback whale, for instance. One of them travelled 19,000 kilometres over 265 days, and half that time was spent in the high seas. And then it's home to secret treasures like microscopic organisms that have adapted to live in those environments. That's William Fenickel. For years, he has researched marine microbes with one goal in mind. Discovering new medicines. Fenical's research has led to two drugs, both of which are in the last stages of development. Painkillers and antibiotics have also been made from material found from the ocean. We've barely scratched the surface. But despite how important it is, and knowing close to nothing about them, the world has lagged behind when it comes to protecting the high seas. And so, the bigwigs of the world have put their heads together and come up with a treaty that does just that. Now we all know that treaties are important, but they also happen to be incredibly dense and super long. So, I took one for the team, I read up on the BBNJ treaty and chatted with some experts, all in the name of protecting the deep blue. If we do this well, we can protect valuable marine life, we can help to stabilise the climate. That's Rebecca Hubbard. She heads an advocacy organisation that has been part of the treaty talks since it began. Over 20 years ago, finally March of 2023, the ship has reached the shore. Celebrations at the UN. 200 countries have come to an agreement to protect the world's oceans. And only made it over the finish line after a marathon 36-hour negotiating session that ended late last night. It is a big deal indeed. The treaty covers three major issues. It has set up a framework for countries to propose and create marine protected areas in the high seas. On land, we might have national parks or reserves. On the high seas, under the high seas treaty, there's really a clear process for how to identify an area that should be protected. It's not entirely clear how they'll go about with it, but harmful human activities could either be regulated or completely banned in these protected areas. The next big point in the treaty deals with assessing the impacts of potentially damaging activities in the high seas. Let's take deep sea mining as an example. It hasn't even started yet, but it is already so controversial. So getting countries to assess the impact of these activities is crucial. And finally, the treaty also says that genetic resources that come from the high seas are actually a common good. We should all have access to them. Here's why that's important. Getting all those genetic material is a lot of work. You need research teams, infrastructure, and of course, a lot of money. And not all countries have the capability to do that. The data and the information must be made public, and that really will give countries and, and people an opportunity to potentially invest in and develop research. Officials negotiating the treaty were under a lot of pressure to finalise it. And so, of course, a lot of questions remain. Like, how will the resources be shared equally? When will they reach countries that can't do independent research? And how will countries be held accountable over their assessments of potentially damaging activities? Figuring all of that out is the next step. 
Meanwhile, the treaty has only been agreed upon. Countries will need to sign the treaty and then ratify it. And that means they'll have to figure out a way to combine the terms of the treaty with their existing rules and laws. This country, one of the world's smallest, was the first to jump on board. 60 countries need to do this for the treaty to go into effect. Experts are hoping that this will happen by the UN Ocean Conference in France in June 2025. In the meantime, what could you and I do about it? It's really, really important for people to communicate to their governments that this is, this is important, governments need to prioritise it, and they always prioritise things if their citizens are telling them it's a priority. If you like this video, please subscribe to Mongo Bay for more. If there are inspiring people, urgent issues or local stories that you would like us to cover, we would love to hear from you. Get in touch with us in the link below. Thanks for watching.